I am Jador bint Abdal Wahid in the SCA. My given name, my mundane name is Helene Martinez. You can catch me on uh, Roadrunner, Facebook, whatever, and ask questions later if you have any. And I, again, I do plan on being back in January for the meeting you have here then and allow much more time, depending on Caitlin, uh, at that point. But what I wanted to cover today is why I feel that I might be qualified to teach you this stuff. I have made boots, <laughs> and there are different boots in process here, so you can see that. My first pair was a pair of turn shoes, which I wore when Lily's walked through, as you can see here. But they were good for Lily's, and they were a good first pair. I took this one apart so you could see how it's made and how easy that can happen. Okay, how easy you can you can do this. If I can do this, you can do this, trust me. So that's my very first pair. Here's one together. They're called turned shoes because you make them with the outside, with the inside out, and then you turn them, so they're right side out, whatever. Look, I even had stuff right here, so it wouldn't my foot wouldn't go through. My second pair, which also went kerflui, were a different style of boot, also taught through the Barony at that point some fifteen years ago. I took them apart one so you could see the steps that it takes to make them, uh, to put them together. So you can see the different style of stitching. So you can see the layers that go together and um, get hands on with that. And after, after this lecture portion, I want to make sure that you get a chance to come up here and touch and feel and do things. This is, this is a certain type of leather. This is a different type of leather. This is yet split skin and suede. And again, these I made in steps, which we'll go over either today or at the class. You can see where they're wearing as well, but they serve the purpose. And again, I can take any part of this apart and remake it, or use it as a pattern or what have you. This was a pair of boots, <coughs> going to be a pair of boots for my son. Here's the bottom part. This is the throat, and we'll get into terminology as well. The reason I chose to do this, that I didn't do on these, because you have to allow a certain amount of space here so that your foot, when arched, will fit into the boot and down into it. That usually leaves this part flopping around, which is this part here is way too big. You can see between here and here, it's, it's, so it flops. So on those boots, I usually put some kind of ankle bracelet or something. But these, the vamp, is to the sole, the heel cup is to the sole, and the heel cup is to the vamp. Again, we'll go over those, and when you have actually have handouts on in January, it'll make more sense. I have some to pass out, which I'll do after a while, but I just want you to get a brief overview. So this could be a shoe in itself, and it's very functional, and it's, it's very period. It's got a little pointy here, um, and it's got the bottom sole, which can then be, this is in process, um, glued, because this is one piece. One way to do it is to glue it down onto something, okay? Uh, there, there are different ways, and we'll go into that after a little while as well. But once you have the rest of the boot made, that's when, um, and I think that's probably what I was stopped on these for, because I wasn't sure if I wanted to glue it now or after I got the throat on it. This is the throat. So the basic parts you have, your sole, the vamp, and the heel, or heel cup. It's referred to as different things depending on whose information you're reading. Then of course, the throat is the stovepipe of the boot itself. So these are a pair, in fact, I think this is two pair in process. So you can look through those after a while. I have different weights of leather, so you can get the feel of them. This suede here is what I used for these. This was another pair of something that didn't come out well. <laughs> One of my experiments that didn't work well. Um, over here I have tools, and feel free to look through those. Waxed sinew, a plastic mallet. This is very thick. It's not closed cell phone, but it's a real hard, 
that when you're taking to put your holes, it doesn't harm your table or your furniture or whatever you're working on. So there's some things in here you can look through. There's hole punches. These, I call them forks. I don't know what they're called. Forks. Good. Oh, then they're forks. No, really. That's but, um, the Monday I was I was taught to make the boots that um, start at the toe and start poking holes, punching your holes around, and then come back and do it the other way. Make sure that whatever number of holes, and this I'll go over when we actually start making them, once you have this part done, whatever number of holes you have on the on the vamp has to match, and, and the heel cup have to match, otherwise it puckers. I'm sorry, complete the sentence. Match the holes that you have in the sole so it doesn't tend to pucker or gather or what have you. Um, you can see on this pair that is, again, top of the turn shoe, when I made it, you see this overlap? It still worked. And as a first pair, it's a first pair. What do you want? But um, it, there's a technical term for that. It's called messing up. Oops. Yeah, it was a big oops, yeah. And this ended up being too tight, so I cut a hole in it, just made it decorative. It worked. So we have different parts. Just again, to let you know, these shoes on the end, I did not make. I did not make these. I will not sew shoes in this manner. But it's very possible. There's no, there's no actual right or left that I can tell, except that I've worn them, and one favors the other. But you have the vamp, a sole, and a heel cup. It's really all you need for a pair of shoes. If you want to make them out of fabric, put them on a nice hard leather, that's fine. It's whatever, really. This is not the history of shoes. This is not how to make them correctly, SCA. This is how Jador learned to make shoes and the experiences I've had within them. So if some costume maven says, it, that's not what I'm here for. This is another type of sandal or slip-on shoe that is still worn in the Middle East. Um, and what I found interesting about these is they have this red rubber sole that's very sure grip. Um, I did not like the extended toe. For me, it did not work at Lily's. And I kept walking out of them because that was the muddy Lily's. But they do have top stitching. They also have an added piece for decoration. They have an, a, two pieces on the toe, this one as well as this one, but it was a nice decoration. There is a place where you could actually put um, some kind of string or leather through to tie it onto your foot. They were just a bother. But with a heel cup, they may stay on. So but those are just samples or examples of what's possible once you get the basics down. This is uh, well-worn. Again, um, I don't know that it was done by hand. It, was, it looks like it was done by machine. However, this is the Ren Fair boot. Uh, old Mountain Ball, Mountain Mother Earth, something like that. But they're at the Kansas City Renaissance Festival. These are priced very, very high. These were over $350. I know they were under four, maybe 375 For this height, they do end up molding to your feet. They are... Uh, guaranteed throughout the life of the boot or the life if something happens to them uh, stitching comes up you wear a toe, hole in the toe or something they're guaranteed to replace them I don't know how long they'll be in business but I take better care of my boots so we don't have that challenge they were real kind about uh, replacing the string the dog had chewed up but but you can when you get a chance when, when the lecture part is done I'll let you come up and you can see all the extra added pieces to make this boot different than anything I would ever hand make. But they're very sturdy. Um, so we have different types of leather. As far as your leather cost, you can probably get leather at Tandy. Make sure you can touch it before you buy it, please. You'll be much happier. Some of the leather that I've purchased um, online, when I got it, it was not real leather and the top of it cracked. And it was just, it just peeled off. I wish I'd kept a sample of it, but I was so angry I just, so this lovely green, I purchased this piece, for, and there's hides and half hides, and you can get into it, but this piece I purchased at Valor, you can see how long it is, and yes, even with the brand, which I think is going to be cool on the throat of a boot, <laughs> even with the brand in it, um, there's a lot of space you could use. 
So, and this is, you know, someone that is smarter and goes into the history of leather and shoes could tell you what weight this is. I know by the feel of it what it's going to feel like on my feet. So, look at your leather. Make sure you look at it carefully. If you don't want this in there, make sure you don't, you know, you look at the whole piece. Um, half hide can go for anywhere from 50 bucks up. If you get it cheaper, check it out. Make sure you look at all the bits that you're going to use. Uh, you see some of these folds in here and stuff. That'll work out with um, clear wax, clear shoe polish. The waxy kind of shoe polish, kiwi stuff. So that's a sample of that. This was to remake these. And this is a little heavier weight than this, and you'll be able to tell when you come up. Sample of the bottoms. My, I get these from a company called Konamo. I want to say they're on Troost or Truman. Konomo, just like it says, K-O-N-O-M-O. They're only open Monday through Friday at a.m. to 4 p.m. If you let them know when you come in that you're SCA, they'll let you wander because they've had very good experiences with us. Um, but I get uh, dependent on who they're for, and I've made boots for Baron Logan, actually um, commissioned two pair of boots. One he still wears, the other was a little snug and he gave it to his son, so his son still wears. But uh, there's this type of heel that, again, all kinds of different heels. This one you can see has the, the lines on it because my son was going to do fighting, so I wanted him to have a short grip. Pardon me, this is just so it doesn't wear in the normal wear, uh, wear and tear walking for lilies or what have you. Do require a shank put into the do you have any kind of a support that goes from heel to, to across the arch? I'm okay. not familiar with that, no. Oh, okay. I don't. Um, all I have is this mm -hmm. piece here, which you can see the split, which is what this was sewed to originally, which is like this. Right, okay. This then gets glued to this piece, which I pre-glued to this piece. Okay. Then what I was doing, because I had access to it, all this excess mm -hmm. and any excess once it's glued on, a drill. Just go around the edge. I'm sorry, jigsaw. Yeah. And um, go around the edge and cut it off. That way, it's fit to this. You don't have to go to that extreme. Okay. It's it's it, as you can see. Once I flatten this out on here, I'm still going to have to cut this away. The easiest way to do that without breaking my hands or scissors is some kind of jigsaw, bandsaw, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't mind wrecking the blade because the blade's going to go through this rubber, it's going to go through the leather, and just get as close to this as you can. But I'm going to show you a different way. When we get to make the boots, I'm going to show you a different way with a welt. Mm -hmm. um, the handouts that I do have, is there anything here you have any questions about that I haven't covered yet? Okay, I mentioned that a vinyl tablecloth we would, it's nice to have a vinyl tablecloth with some kind of flannel backing because when you cut out your pattern, first we're going to do it onto newspaper or some sort of paper medium, and um, then we're going to transfer that to the vinyl tablecloth because when you sew leather, it doesn't behave like fabric. This tends to behave more like leather and less like fabric because it doesn't have the bias, it doesn't pull. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is wiser to cut it out of this before you cut it out of the leather. Because if you make a mistake on this, they're what, a dollar at the dollar store or something? <clears throat> so you can draw it on here, you can draw it on this side, then you sew it together. You find, when we do that, you'll find the steps that make it easier to sew it together and actually try it on and see if it's going to fit or not, because there's no sense in going the expense of wrecking your leather when you could have taken this little step. Once you know that your pattern does fit your foot, then you won't have to do this again. However, it might be wise to save it. So had I remembered where mine was in the several moves I've made, I would have brought it. But that's a sample as well. Um, we covered this. We covered these. Um, most of my information on actually making shoe boots comes from a website 
you can find the gentleman's name is Mark, M-A-R-C, Carlson, C-A-R-L-S-O-N, and he is like the go-to guy for boots. Any information that I have more than likely came from his website. His website is entitled Footwear of the Middle Ages. And I have for your perusal, but I don't have copies today. Again, I'll have copies of anything you want later or get them yourself off the website. Of glossary of for footwear terminology, basic history of turn shoes, if you'll pass those when you're done. Um, some of the turn shoe with its little, thin little um, sole was sometimes worn or usually worn out with things called uh, patens or Chopin, I'm not sure how they pronounce that, but wooden clogs of some sort. This is a little handout on those and if you choose to make those as well. Again, these are all from Mark Carlson's website. And this talks about the pointy toe shoes, you know, the, the ones that look like elves wore them at one time. This is the one that I may have enough, I may have enough of this for the three of you that are here today. Um, and I do appreciate your coming. This is the general instructions. So let me make sure I just go through this here. Yes. Don't let it confuse you with all the diagrams. Um, this one is of making the shoe, and it talks of making it on a last. Now, a last is the wooden, uh, carved wooden piece that looks like a shoe. Uh, I'm sorry, like a foot. And this gentleman works with a last, and he forms the shoe around the last. However, I don't have that. I'm not going to carve one, so I brought it in case anybody else wants to uh, go that route. And there's more on that. And this one, again, this is all off his website, talks about the easy way out and different ways you can get around making a boot itself by making false tops to go over the brown shoes you have or black shoes you have, uh, <coughs> what could look period, what, it's just a different option. Um, then in this one I have previous class information that, again, I may have extra. So if I do, you're welcome to them. This is the original, I can tell it has staple holes in it. This one, we will eventually have copies. This is how to measure your foot. It's very important, you cannot measure your own foot. Can I do that one now? Uh, I do have... This is the one these are not stapled together, so I apologize. But these, this is the one that I will bring that everyone will get handouts on because it does break it down easy enough for me. So that's what I'm most comfortable with, and that might help a little bit more. That's a copy. Then I also have basic supply list, uh, um, different types of shoe patterns which are not in any real order, but if you can kind of keep them in the order they're sort of in right now, that would help. And just for showing, this is how I came up with my pattern. Hi, look at it. This was the bottom of, of a copy I made. The original, of course, would have had my foot outlined in it. This is on here. There are measurements that you can see how I measured it across. So this is the vamp, this is the heel, or heel cup. The line on here was where I was going to reinforce the gray pair of boots that I showed you here. And you can sort of see that stitching line where I added that extra. So that's those, and This, of course, was the throat that went with that pair of shoes. So, so this is why even manila folders will work. And then this Hi. And I'll show you today. I will be showing you today how to. Oh, there it is. How to draft your own pattern. 
but you again you cannot draw your own foot pattern because somebody because you have to have your weight on your foot so somebody will have to draw it for you and I know we have some newspaper we could get to that in a little bit there's the outline of my foot who worked right there and kept it all together so we'll do that and that was a good idea but that's not one of my email um, but I've given you enough this I'm not sure where this one came from uh, Oh, from Shadow. But it doesn't show an, an address. But this, this has um, very similar to the information that I've already passed around. However, it has space for you to fill in your own. And if that's something that you all would like to do instead of just drawing it on the pattern like I did over there, uh, then you'll have it somewhere on paper for safekeeping. So that is the basic outline of what we'll be doing and what we'll be touching and feeling and everything. Do you guys have any questions at all? Alrighty then. Then I'm going to have a cup of coffee and we'll continue with the drawing pattern here in a minute.